So we will solve one last problem, okay? Uh, this is really reflective of what you have in your homework. to the other through a valve, an outlet valve, there is some resistance to the flow. I'm going to call it as R1 here. And R2 here. Okay. And then there is an outlet flow, which we are going to call as QMO. The height of the fluid in each of the tanks I'll call as H1 and H2. So this is H1. Obviously, it's a function of time because the flow rate is also a function of time. Okay, then I have the height H2 here. Is the height of the fluid in there? That's also a function of time. And the area of the tanks, we're going to assume to be the same. Okay, so area of the tanks A1 is equal to A2 is equal to A, and when I imply area of the tank, this is what I mean. All right, so this area along the third dimension is a constant. Okay, so this is area A1 and area A2 as well. And uh, let's say that the resistance is proportional to square root of the height difference. So R is some C times square root of delta H and you'll know the meaning of the square root of delta H in a, in a minute or so. Okay. And let me do the following as well. Let me call the flow rate through the first resistance as QM12. Right? It's going from tank 1 to tank 2. Okay? That's why it's QM12. All right. And uh, you're told QMI is rho times QI. So all of these flow rates that we specify are the mass flow rates. We always start with that. And then we go to volumetric flow rates. And QM naught is rho times Q naught. The input to the system is the inlet flow rate. Okay, so system input. As usual, this is comprised of two pieces, which we looked at last class. QI has a steady or a uniform or a constant part. 
which is the average flow rate. And then I have some small fluctuations or perturbations <laughs> about this actual flow, okay, about this constant flow. This perturbation is delta QI or a disturbance. This is typically because of pressure fluctuations as the inlet fluid comes in. It could also be because of inefficiencies in how the pump operates, the pump that is supplying the inlet fluid is operating. So all of these contribute to some disturbances. Okay? Because there is a disturbance in the input, the variables of the problem also have some disturbances or have some fluctuations. So the variables, H1, H1S, L H1, H2 S, L H2 of T, these are the problem variables or the problem parameters <coughs> and obviously the output of the problem is Q0 which is some state value. plus a fluctuation, okay? And the whole idea of this problem is this. I have some inlet flow rate. If everything was fine and dandy, the inlet flow rate would be coming in at a constant rate. If the inlet flow rate is coming in at a constant or an average rate, what would be the outflow rate? The outflow would also be constant. And it would be equal to the inlet flow rate. That's a no-brainer, right? We will see this as well, okay? If you don't see, we will see it as well. But the problem is, okay, the inlet flow rate has some disturbances or fluctuations due to factors that we cannot control. And what we would like to see is, okay, how does this fluctuation or disturbance affect the output or the outlet flow rate? Okay, that's the significance of this problem. And this is a problem that you typically have in filtration systems, chemical processing plants, and so on. Okay, how is the inflow rate affecting the outflow rate? For certain, if the inflow rate is a, uh, let's say if delta QI is some A sin omega T, and then in, in this situation, we would think that omega is the parameter that can be controlled by us, okay, which is the, maybe based on the pump characteristics, maybe based on how I select the pipelines for my input flow and so on. So omega is a parameter that I can control and the aim would become to find out the value of omega for which the output fluctuations are minimal. That's all the problem is, okay? Most efficient way of transporting or transferring fluid, okay? Okay, so what's the problem we need to obtain? Transfer function relating Delta Q naught and Delta Q I. Okay. For convenience, I'm going to label a few points. Okay, so I'll call this as point one. And then location right after that is location two. Then let's call this as Location three, location four. Okay, so I have labeled four locations. One right before I enter the resistance. Okay, I'm calling it as location one. Then one right after that, location two, location three, and then location four. <coughs> Atmospheric pressure prevails at location four. Okay, and also here on the free surface of the fluid, there is atmospheric pressure. And our aim is obtain the transfer function. All right, so we start our procedure the same way as we have done in the previous lecture. We start with the governing equation, okay, which is conservation of mass. You have two systems, you have two tanks, so you employ the conservation of mass two times. And that's about all it is. Okay, so first tank. Conservation of mass says that the rate of change of mass that is stored is equal to the mass inflow rate 
which is QMI into the tank minus the mass flow rate going out of the tank which is going to be QM12. This is the conservation of mass for tank. Now for tank 2. Because of fluctuations in the inlet flow rate, there is going to be some changes to the height of the fluid. So you're going to have dm2 by dt, which is the stored mass flow uh, change, uh, stored mass change within tank 2. This is now going to be the inlet to tank 2. What is the inlet flow rate to tank 2 is actually the outlet flow rate from tank 1. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay, what is the arrow entering tank 2? It is qm12. So it's QM12 minus QM out, whatever is flowing out. These are the governing equations. Both of them are first order ODEs. But then there is a coupling between the two systems because the inlet flow rate of one is the outlet flow rate of the other. And this coupling induces a second order dynamics into the system. The problem we saw in the last class was the first problem with the first order dynamics. It was a first order system. Right? So if you are doing frequency response to a first order system, mostly in the absence of numerator dynamics, you are going to get a either a low pass or a high pass filter. There will not be much to it. Okay? But second order, many things can happen, depending on the problem. And you will see why it is a second order as well. All right, any questions so far? Let me proceed. Okay, so mass is density times volume. Volume in this particular situation, because the area is a constant, it's area times the height. Please take a look at my lecture notes from the previous lecture. I have solved a problem where the fluid area is no longer constant. Okay, that's for a conical tank. This is now going to be rho times. A times H, which means M1 is rho A1 H1. Which implies that the mass flow change, uh, mass stored change, rho times A1, dH1 by dt. And by the same stretch, I'm just going to write dm2 by dt. And I want you to keep this consciously in your mind. This is a fairly straightforward problem solely because the density is a constant. <laughs> if the density were changing as a function of time, which means if you have a gas instead of a liquid flowing, then this problem is going to take on a whole different set of wheels. Okay? Okay, now our aim is to calculate QM12 and then QMO. So QM12, the flow rate is a change in the pressure by the resistance or inversely the resistance is change in pressure by the flow rate. So this is, look at this, the location of the higher pressure is P1 because fluid is flowing from 1, 2 to 2. Okay, so this is P1 minus P2. <coughs> divided by R1. P1 and P2 can be written in terms of atmospheric pressure and the height. So this is Pa rho G H1, Pa divided by R1. Now I'm going to make the substitution for R1. And before that, let me cancel off some of these terms. So you have one rule. It is just rho g h1 minus h2 by r1, which means that r1, which is given as some constant times the change in the height, has to be that constant times delta h, which is h1 minus h2. Okay, so this is now going to be 
rho g by some constant, let's say c1, okay? Square root. The change in the height is h1 minus h2 for the first attack. So this is going to be square root of h1 minus h2. I just want to make sure everybody is clear on what I've done here. You're told that the resistance is c times delta h square root. Okay, what is the delta h? It depends on which tank you're looking at. For this first tank, delta h is h1 minus h2. Okay? And uh, I'm just going to write this as the following. So q m12. This g by c1, I'm going to club it together and call it as an alpha. So this is some rho times alpha 1. h1 minus h2. Same idea for QMO is the pressure at location 3, right? And subtract that from the pressure at location 4 by R2. But obviously, you should recognize that P2 and P3 are at the same height. And both of them are in between the two resistances, which means P2 and P3 are the same. Okay? So P2 and P3 and I want to see if this makes sense to everyone. I'm not saying that P1 is the same as P2 is the same as P3, no. Even though P1 and P2 and P3 are at the same height, I'm saying only P2 is equal to P3 because what is happening between the two? Not a damn thing. It is just fluid flowing through. There is no resistance there. Okay, fantastic. All right, so this is just going to be PA rho GH2. Pressure at the fourth location is just atmospheric. Y R2. Cancel off the PA terms. If in your mass flow rate expressions you get an atmospheric pressure term, something is wrong. Okay, you're taking the pressure difference, so the atmospheric pressure always cancels off. So this is just going to be rho g h2. Now I bring in resistance r2. What is the change in height here? It is just h2. So this is c2 square root of h2. If I had another tank, if I had a third tank connected to the outlet of the second tank, then I would have h2 minus h3. The resistance would be c2 times square root of h2 minus h3 and so on and so forth okay all right so qmo <coughs> rho times this g by c2 i'm going to call this alpha 2 so this is alpha 2 and square root of h2 by extension this is also rho times Q naught. So I can now write my fluid uh, equations. Those are the equations of the system or the model for the system. I just have to do the substitute. Start off with the first one. Okay, so rho A1 dH1 by dt. QMI is rho times QI, which is the volumetric flow rate. So this is rho times Qi minus rho times alpha 1 times h1 minus h2. Perform the simplifications, cancel of the rows so that dh1 by dt is Qi by a1, alpha 1 by a1. This is the first one. Okay, we do the same thing for the second one. Rho times A times dH2 by dt is QM12. So the outlet from the first one is the inlet to the second one. So this is alpha 1 minus alpha 2 H2. Just substituting back into the conservation equations. Okay. Cancel of the rows, and I have dH2 by dt is 
is alpha 1 by A2. H1 minus H2. Alpha 2 by A2. H2. I have three equations, okay? The third one is boxed here. So that third equation, I'm going to rewrite here and say this Q0 is alpha 2 root of H2. And so what do we do? We need the transfer function, right? If you have the transfer function, you need to take Laplace transforms. If you have to take Laplace transforms, you have to have a linear system. Obviously, this is not a linear system because I have a square root of H2. I have a square root of H1, functions of time. This is not a linear system. I have square root of H2 there. So I need to linearize. With your permission, I'm going to pull the top handle down. I'm going to rewrite those three equations. Please do not rewrite it again. So here are my equations. alpha 2 root of h2. These are lots of constants and stuff. I'm going to do the following. Until I tell you to do it, please don't do it. I'm going to set all the areas to be equal to 1. I'm going to say alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2 is equal to 1. But in the homework, please keep it as alpha. Just say alpha 1 is equal to alpha 2 is equal to 1. That usually does not happen because the flow resistance of two, two of these pipes will be different from each other, obviously. Right? But this is just for simplicity, just to go through the procedure. So with that said, here are the equations that I need to linearize. Okay? Start with the first one. So that's dh1 by dt is qi h1 minus h2. Okay? Then dh2 by dt is h1 minus h2 minus square root of h2. And then the third one First things first, if everything was at, at a constant flow rate, if the inlet flow rate was constant, okay, so if qi is equal to qis, then what would happen is that all the height should be constants as well. Which implies Then I would also have the outlet as a constant value. Q naught is Q naught S. I 
I'm just going to substitute everything into equations 1, 2, and 3, and we will obtain a set of static equations. Those are called, as typically, static equilibrium, what you do in statics. Right? Then when you do dynamics, you would then incorporate the change in the time <coughs> parameters. Your momentum change is no longer going to be zero. You'll have a certain accelerated motion. That's exactly what's happening here, dh by dt. Yes, question. I have a quick question. So in that case, you just put that. Would it also not as p or Absolutely. That's what we're going to prove. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's solely because the uh, alpha 1s and alpha 2s are, I mean, even, even in that case, they should be the same. They should be the same. Absolutely. We're going to show you. So substitute. From the first one, I have QIS minus H1S is 0. Then I have H1S, H2S. Okay, these are two equations that we can see very obviously coming from equations 1 and 2. This is equation 4. Equation 5. From the third equation, Q0 S is root of, this is equation 6. This is just direct substitution into equation 3. If you solve these, you will end up getting the following as, as you rightly pointed out. Q not s will be the same as QIS. And then I would have H2S is QIS squared. And then I would get H1S is 2 times H2S, which means that I can solve this problem statically. It is a determined system. Okay, I have as many number of equations as I'm saying. This is typically not required of us, but here is what it tells us. I now know what the operating point is. Right? If I know QIS, I know Q0S, I know H2S, I know H1S. So I know everything about the operating point. Okay, it's not an unknown quantity anymore. Okay? All right. Questions? Why are we doing that step is to obtain what the operating point is. That is the point about which you linearize the system. I know QIS, that's an input quantity. I don't know Q0S, I don't know H1S, I don't know H2S, but now I do know it. Okay? We have found it out completely. And so from that point of view, the systems that we solve in system dynamics, they're all called deterministic systems. If I know something about the system at some initial time, I know everything about the system at the next time increment, and so on and so forth. So I keep marching forward. Okay? That's Newtonian mechanics, essentially. That's not sufficient for us. We need to linearize. It is QI, H1 minus H2. I'm going to call this as F1 function. <coughs> F1, it's a function of QI, all of the time varying quantities, QI, H1, and H2. This is nonlinear, which means we have to linearize it. Why do we need to linearize it? Because we have to apply Laplace transform. Otherwise, I don't really care. If you take this in Simulink, which you will be doing much more uh, largely in 3360, you can easily see that systems like these, you just plug it into Simulink, you can solve them. The greatest advantage of computational tools is you can solve nonlinear problems. We have only limited sets of solutions for nonlinear problems analytically. And that's why we have to resort to linearization and so on. Okay? So linearize it about the operating point. The operating point is QIS, H1S, H2S, whatever are the time varying functions of that function. This is actually a function L. It's a function of a function. Okay? So this is operating point is QIS, H1S, H2S. So we linearize the system around this point. We 
in the interest of time, I'm going to take some liberties. I'm going to do the linearization quickly. I'll show this one fully. So F L 1, which means that this is a linearized version of this function. Qi h1 and h2. This is first of all the function evaluated at the operating point. So this is f1 at qis, h1s, h2s, and then I'm going to have a series of differences and partial differentials. Okay, I'm going to have qi minus qis df1 by dqi at the operating point plus h1, h1s, partial derivative of the function f1 at the operating point. And likewise the third h2, And this is nothing but your multivariable Taylor series expansion up to the first order. Okay? We stop at the first order because we want a linear system. Does this make sense to everybody? Yes. Um, you chose your like your your function of functions. You chose that one just because it had all three things in it. Oh no, I, I just I just call this as a big function. Right. And that, you use that one instead of equation 2 up there. Instead of equation two. Oh, I'm going to do a separate one for that too. Oh, okay. I have to linearize each and every one of right. them. Absolutely, absolutely. Each of them are nonlinear. Even equation 3 is nonlinear. Right. I have to linearize each and every one of them. The only thing I don't know what to linearize about is an operating point. And that we have found out is something that we can calculate with numbers. If I were given QIS, I would calculate H1S, H2S, and so on. Okay? So I have to do the linearization three times in this problem. From last class, you have seen that the evaluation of the actual function at the operating point gives us zero. Okay? So I'm not going to go through that detail. So this first term ends up being zero. Each of the differences become the perturbations themselves. So this is now del qi of t and h1 minus h1s and h2 minus h2 has become del h1 and del h2. Evaluation of the partial differentials, I'm going to do that quickly. This will just give me one, okay? It is just taking that function, the actual function, and then differentiating it, and then substituting the operating point. d by dh1 of the full function, which is qi minus, That's the second partial differential. I'll do this. The first term does not contain any h1, so there is no differentiation. The second term is an amalgam of h1 and h2 within this radical sign. So I have to first differentiate the radical sign and then h1 within the radical sign. Right? So this is going to be minus 1 by 2 differentiation of the square root, then differentiation of h1. Okay, so this is coming from the fact that I'm doing d by d h1 of h1, which is this term there. If there was a h1 square, I would have had to do d by d h1 of h1 square. Okay, this is evaluated at the operating point so that df1 by d h1 is minus half h1s, h2s to the power minus 1 by 2. I'm just going to call it as minus some constant k1. <coughs> in the exam and in the homework, I would like to see these differentiations done. Okay? Even though they will end up giving you constants, I would still like to see it. 
because you're going to have actual numbers in there. All right, the last one, d by d h two of f one, which is q i. And as I said, I'll do this. This is evaluated at the operating point. Please notice this. First differentiation of the square root term, so that's going to be minus. The first term is qi, does not contain h2, so you skip 2. So this is minus h1 minus h2 to the power minus 1 by 2, then differentiation of minus h2, which is going to be minus 1. Okay, so this is now d by d h2 of minus h2, so that df1 by d h2 is I have a negative sign, I have another negative sign combined to give me a positive sign, so this is plus half h1s minus 1 by 2 or plus. Okay. There is no thinking involved here, okay? This is just brute work. The mind has gone for a walk. The thinking involved was in coming up with the initial equations of the system. Okay, I'm going to do the substitutions. I'm going to pull up the top panel. I'm not going to spend time doing the differentiations of the other two, okay? is now h1s plus some change, right? So this is h1s plus delta h1. This is equal to the linearized version. Substitute for the linearized version. So I have d by dt. This is the rate of change of the perturbation. Okay, it's a function of time because the inlet is a function of time as well, the inlet perturbation. This is going to be del qi minus k1 <coughs> delta h1 <coughs> linearized version of equation 1, right? So this is for the first time. This is now the linearized. the same thing for the second one. Okay, the second one is dh2 by dt is h1 minus h2 minus square root of h2, okay, which I will call as f2. It's a separate function. f2 of h1 and h2 only because there is no inlet flow rate involved here. And this is also nonlinear. which means I have to linearize it if I have to take the Laplace transform. So that F2 linear is F2 evaluated at the operating point. There is no QIS, so I don't need to substitute QIS here, but we know that this term is anyway going to vanish, the first term in the failure series expansion, plus H1, H1S, df2 by dh1 plus h2 h2s df2 by
first term is 0. The second and the third terms, I am not going to evaluate them, but this is what you will end up getting. So, d by dt of h2s plus del h2, which will just give you d del h2 by dt. the linearized version of that equation. H11 is H11 is del H1 and likewise for the other. So I have the sum Incidentally, I'll end up getting the same K1, okay? And if you go through my notes, you'll see why that is the case. But this is just differentiation, so I'm going to skip all those details. The third thing I need to take care of is Q0, which was alpha 2 times square root of H2, but then alpha 2, I said, is equal to 1. This is also nonlinear. <coughs> so linearize. at the operating point of H2s, right? Because there is only one function of time here. So if I linearize, I get Q0 is Q0 evaluated at the operating point, and then differentiation of that, so that's H2 minus H2s. And then d by dh2 of at the operating. Okay, this is a linearized version. So this is q not that. main objective in mind, uh, our objective is to obtain a transfer function that relates qi and q0. To get to that objective, we have to take care of all these nonlinear differential equations. They are very pesky. You have to go through this linearization process and so on. But once we're done with it, then the route <coughs> should eventually be smooth. When I'm eventually done with the last one, I get the following. So q0 linearized is q0 evaluated at the operating point is q0s plus some <coughs> constant times. This is a linearized version. Bring the Q0 onto the other side. <coughs> where the K3 is <coughs> evaluated at the operating. Q0 minus Q0 s is del Q0 of t, so that's a perturbation. Del Q0 is A3 This is now my main equation one. Now I'm listing all the linearized equations. Okay, the second one is D del H1 by dt is del Qi k1 del h1, k1 del h2. What is the only difference between this problem and your homework is in your homework the Resistance is no longer square root of h. It is just h to the power 2 by 5. So the only change would come in the evaluation of these constants k1, k2, and k3, and so on. Nothing else. It's absolute carbon copy. All right.
So the last one, this is equation two. And D del H2 K1 equation three. Three equations, I have three variables. Input variable is not counted as something that is unknown here. We know del QI related to del Q0. Take Laplace of 1, 2, and 3. Okay, so Laplace transforms. Laplace of the first one, capital del Q0 of S. Is some K3 del H2 of S. Watch this. Laplace of this term is S times delta H1. Okay. Laplace of this term is minus K1 times delta H1 of S. I'm going to bring that on to the left hand side and combine them together as S plus K1. Okay. So this is going to be S plus K1 delta H1 of S. Where did the S plus K1 come from? I have a K1 on the right hand side accompanying delta H1. I have a differentiation of delta H1, which gives me the S plus K1. Okay? And then this is del QI plus K1 delta H1 Same story here. S plus I bring the K2 delta H2 onto the left hand side, combine that with the differentiation term, so that's going to be S plus K2 delta H2 is K1 that's the last time I'm lifting that put the semester at least All I have to do is the following. From the first equation, delta H2 is that's the first one. From the second one, I would look at the following and say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll skip the second one, I'll go to the third one, okay, because then I can say that delta H1 is from the third one, it's S plus K2, Y K1 delta H2 of S, but I want delta H1 in terms of delta Q0 so that I can substitute it into the middle one, okay, this is just a manipulation of the three, this is S plus K2, That first one comes from the first equation after the Laplace. The second one comes from the third equation after the Laplace. Take all of these garbage and put it in the third, second equation there. I end up getting the following. S plus K1 delta H1. Instead of delta H1, it's going to be S plus K2 by K1, K3, delta Q0. Delta QI remains as it is. And instead of delta H2, I'm going to substitute the first one. It's going to be delta Q0, K1 by K3. Does everybody follow the manipulations? Your aim is to get delta QI and Q0 as one equation. You do everything you have to do to get that equation. That's all we are doing. Okay? I simplify the last one. 
S plus K1, S plus K2. I bring the delta Q0 onto the left hand side, that becomes K1 square. Common denominator. Simplify. Okay, what did I do? Bring this here. The common denominator is K1, K3. Take the common denominator, I get a K1 square because this K1, K3 is going to be multiplied by K1 by K3. Negative sign is because I brought it to the left hand side. Then take all of those fellows, stick it with delta QI. Transfer function that I need. T of S. Output, input, so that's K1, K3, divided by S plus K1, S plus K2, second order, depending on what the damping ratio is going to be, you will have a T peak and so on. So here is what you should be prepared for. You will have a problem of this type, you will have a problem from electrical systems, one problem from mechanical systems. Either in the electrical system or the fluid system problem, I will eventually ask you to obtain